Blues, of course, winning the Stanley Cup. Yes. Let's go Blues. We also have Father's Day today, so there's a lot to celebrate uh, with our family. Hopefully you, uh, you guys find some time to, to hang out with family today. Uh, and for me, I think, if memory serves me correctly, I think that this week is my fifth anniversary at New Heights, actually. I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure five years ago this week was my first week with the youth group. So it's kind of hard to believe it's been that long already, but uh, it's, been, it's been a good five years. So thanks for being good to me uh, over those five years. So um, let me go ahead and pray, and uh, we'll get going. Father, thank you uh, for just uh, keeping everyone safe yesterday downtown, and um, we just ask that uh, you will just watch over us this morning and um, just be with us as we go through um, your word, and we just ask that you speak to us through your word and through your spirit, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're in a series called Be Weird, and uh, Harvester Christian Church and, and us, we actually are borrowed this series from a church down in Texas that did it earlier this year. Uh, and this series is about finances. And we're talking about finances and how the Bible challenges us to sort of buck the trend and do things a little bit differently than the rest of the world does things when it comes to finances. And we talked the last couple of weeks about some things that are normal in our culture some things like uh, overspending and impulse buying and how uh, the Bible uh, does not really uh, encourage that. We talked about some other things that are normal, like um, spending our money selfishly instead of selflessly. Um, we talked about how uh, in our culture it's very normal to have a really unnecessary amount of debt. And Scott talked about debt last week for us. One more thing that's normal that we're going to talk about today, and this one's a little bit uh, on a little bit different wavelength, but one other thing that's very normal in our culture when it comes to finances is worry. Worrying. Any worriers in the room? Probably not going to raise your hand. A couple of you are brave enough. Let's be honest. All of us worry sometimes, and some of us worry a lot. <laughs> some of us, it's just second nature to worry. It's easy to worry, isn't it? We've got the house payment and the car payment and the utility bills and maybe some medical bills and uh, maybe student loans we're trying to pay off and groceries that we have to buy every month and maybe your car broke down and maybe you're trying to save up for retirement and there's lots and lots of things to potentially worry about, isn't there? When we think about our future, it's easy to worry about, am I going to be able to make it? Am I going to be able to make it even this week, let alone this month, this year? And so worry is a really interesting thing when you stop to think about it because it's something that's clearly discouraged in the Bible. Uh, the Bible uh, clearly speaks against worry. It's, it's not something we're supposed to do. But yet, uh, when it comes to worry, for some reason, we sort of give people a free pass on it, don't we? I mean, when you really think about it, worry is not something that we really keep each other accountable with, is it? I don't think I've ever heard of a worry intervention before, right? We sort of just give people a free pass. Some people are worriers, and we don't ever really try to walk them through that. Um, and so we need to learn how to keep each other more accountable to stop worrying about our future, about our finances, whatever it is. Um, because the Bible says uh, that worrying about the future is a sin. Worrying about the future is actually a sin. And I know what you might be thinking. I don't remember the Bible actually saying that worry is a sin. And you're right about that. The Bible does not explicitly say that worry is a sin. But uh, when you look at the Bible as a whole and you put two and two together, uh, you can safely conclude that it definitely falls under that category of sin. Uh, we know from many passages in the Bible that a lack of faith or a lack of trust in God is a sin, right? We have many, many examples of that in Scripture. For example, Moses is, is not allowed to go into the promised land uh, because he lacked faith in God in, in a moment, and um, God uh, punished him for it. We know that the, the 12 spies were sent in to spy on Canaan in the promised land. Ten of them lacked faith, 
And as a result, the whole Israelite community was punished. And so we know that it's a sin to lack faith and lack trust in God. And really, at the end of the day, isn't that what worry really is? At the end of the day, that's essentially what worry is. It's a lack of faith in, in the fact that God has promised he will take care of you. It's, it's a failure to trust in the Lord. <clears throat> and it's giving in. It's also it's giving in to the temptation to believe that you are in control rather than God being in control, right? That's what worry is. It's, we feel, we give in to that temptation that I can, if I just worry enough and stress enough about it, I can somehow control what's going to happen in my life rather than leaving it in God's hands. Let's read a passage from Luke chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 12. We're going to be in there a bit today. Luke chapter 12, starting verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? See there again, Jesus associating worry with a lack of faith. Verse 29, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And so Jesus here, basically what this boils down to, Jesus says, worrying, guys, is silly. <laughs> It's silly. It's pointless. He says, how many of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? In other words, what is worry going to accomplish? It's not going to, it's not going to accomplish uh, anything. And Jesus says, look at how God provides for the birds in the air and the flowers in the field. He takes care of them. And how much more valuable are you in his sight than a flower? And so we can trust that if God takes care of even the flowers in the field, He's going to take care of you because you're very valuable and precious to him. Corey Tenboom said this. She said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It simply empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And she's exactly right. She's saying the same thing Jesus said. She basically is saying worry is useless. It doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything. It's, it's pointless. It serves no positive purpose. It only makes you suffer. This is all it does. And so uh, this is easier said than done, though, isn't it? Especially for those of us who it's second nature for us to worry. It's, it's easier said than done, right? Um, for some of us, it's, it's actually very, very difficult to stop worrying. When we think about the future, and all the obstacles we might face and all the, all the potentially bad things that could happen, we worry. That's what we do. But remember, we talked a couple weeks ago about how, again, this uh, dealing with our finances, it requires a certain amount of faith. You're not going to be able to follow the Lord and please Him with your finances and stop worrying without a certain level of faith. It requires a little bit of uh, you got to jump out there and take a leap of faith. Proverbs chapter 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. So when we worry, we're trying to rely on ourselves, aren't we? But Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. If you acknowledge Him, He will make your paths straight. And so this passage says, stop leaning on our own understanding and start leaning on the Lord. And so according to the Bible, it's uh, fairly simple, from a, at least from an intellectual perspective, maybe not in the heart, but from an intellectual perspective, it's fairly simple. You can 
uh, either worry or you can walk by faith. It's a choice you make. You have a choice. Which one are you going to choose, to worry or to trust in the Lord? And now, you could read this passage in Matthew, and some might read this passage and come to some false conclusions. You could read this passage in Matthew that Jesus has, and you could say, well, great. I don't have to worry about anything. God's going to provide for me, and so I don't have to work hard. I don't have to save up for myself. I don't have to be a good steward of what I have because, hey, God's going to take care of it all. I don't have to, I don't have to worry at all, right? That would be taking it to an extreme. That would be actually the furthest uh, thing from the truth that, that you could come to. This passage is not giving us a free pass uh, to just be a lazy bum and to look for excuses not to work. Uh, what it tells us is that we don't have to worry about whether God will take care of us or not. So uh, not worrying is much different than not working, right? You still have to work. Um, so this passage doesn't tell us that we shouldn't work hard, and it, doesn't, it definitely doesn't tell us that we shouldn't save. In fact, the Bible says it's smart to save. Saving for the future is smart, according to the Bible. And so we have to find this balance between not worrying, but also being diligent, right? And being intentional and, and working hard and, and trying to be a good steward of what you have and, and save up. Uh, fortunately, I married a saver. Haley is a saver. She never spends money. Even when she needs something, she won't spend it. And uh, literally just this week, actually, is a classic example of how Haley lives her life. Just this week, I noticed she had some new shoes on. I said, hey, those are nice shoes. She said, thanks. They were $5 at Walmart. And so she, she splurged, in her mind, she splurged by finally buying a $5 pair of shoes at Walmart. And she actually told me, I don't think I've bought a pair of casual shoes since I was in college, which would have been about 10 years ago at this point. So that tells you how Haley likes to save. She doesn't like to spend. And so I'm a lucky guy. She keeps me accountable in that area. It's very nice. But for most of us, again, uh, just like worrying uh, some of us, uh, that comes naturally. For some of us, it doesn't come naturally to save. Actually, probably most of us, it does not come naturally to save. We have to learn to be more intentional about this. Let's read what Proverbs chapter 6 says, uh, verse 6. It says, go to the ant, talking about the animal, the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief. And so this proverb is talking to those who like to find excuses not to work hard, not to be diligent, not to save up, and it actually calls us sluggards when we do that. Uh, it's, it's not holding back any punches. Uh, the author of Proverbs here says, hey, look at what the ant does. It stores up food and it saves for the future. And so first of all, isn't it amazing how God put animals on this earth that have a, a better work ethic than we do sometimes <laughs> and that we can actually learn valuable life lessons from uh, the little ant? I think it's fascinating how God created the world. But we learn two things from ants in this passage. The first is that hard work pays off, right? Hard work pays off, and we should uh, learn from their example and work hard. The second thing we see is that we should save up whatever we can. We should save up uh, as much as we can. Now, there are a lot of people, of course, who struggle financially and struggle to, to save up. And, you know, you're just managing to get by month by month. A lot of us are in that boat. And uh, many of us who are in that boat, when it comes to saving, we have a tendency to just kind of throw up our hands in defeat, right? We say, well, I can't save up anything substantial, uh, so I'm just not even going to try. That's what a lot of us do. Yeah, but the Bible says that even if you can only save up a little bit at a time, that's the wise thing to do. You should try. Proverbs 13 says this, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little will make it grow. Proverbs 21 says, The wise man saves for the future, 
But the foolish man spends whatever he gets. <laughs> so it calls us foolish when we do that, when we don't save for the future. We are actually, we're behaving foolishly. And so if you only have $5 at the end of the month to save, Proverbs says, save it. Right? Don't spend it. Don't throw up your hands and defeat. Save whatever you can save. Be diligent about that. That's the wise thing to do. And now I know uh, what some of you might be thinking. You devil's advocates out there, you might be thinking, wait a second, isn't there a parable where Jesus talks against saving up? Uh, Well, uh, sort of. Let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, Luke chapter 12, actually just before our passage about worry, in Luke 12, verse 16, Jesus says this. It says, he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. Again, you see that word fool, foolishness. So, uh, uh, again, the Bible is... is uh, just just being blatantly honest with us sometimes, right? You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And so then the verses directly after this uh, is the verses we just read where Jesus talks about worrying. And so uh, it says, right after that, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will wear. So Jesus tells the parable of this rich fool who stores up his riches, uh, not to tell us not to save money. That's not the point of this passage. He's, telling, he's not telling us don't save up. We know, again, from other passages in the Bible that it is smart to save. But he gives us this parable for probably two reasons. The first again, is to warn us not to worry. Don't worry about the future. And the second reason is to warn us not to store up for ourselves for selfish gain, not to store up for the pursuit of of laziness and a lazy retirement, but instead to be rich toward God. And so what Jesus says here is, Hey, you know, when you do save up, what are your motives, essentially, is what he's saying. Are your motives for saving so that you can just kick it in the hammock for the rest of your life and never do anything productive? Or is it uh, for uh, more righteous motives? And are you being, he says, rich toward God. This is what will happen to those who are not rich toward God. So we have to think about how can I be rich toward God with what I have, which leads us to our last point, which is that When it comes to all of this stuff, worrying, saving, putting God first is the goal. Putting God first is the main goal that we have to have. Scripture makes it clear that pleasing God needs to be our first priority in all things, including finances, especially finances. Pleasing God needs to be the goal. Do you know why it's normal? Do you know why it's normal for people to be stressed and worried about their finances? Most of the time, it's because they're not putting God first. Uh, We talked a couple weeks ago about how we have to look at money from a different lens. What do we view the purpose of money? What do we view money at its core? What, What purpose does it serve? What is its function? The reason we get stressed and worried is because we tend to think that money is here to serve me, right? With my money, I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to be able to save up for myself. I'm going to be able to get rid of these worries and fears with money. That's what money can do for me. But instead, what we need to start doing is looking at money and saying, how can I please the Lord with this? Money is just another thing that we can use to please the Lord and to pursue righteous things. And so instead of thinking, how can I serve myself? We need to be thinking, how can I serve God with what I have? In Philippians chapter 4, Paul thanks some of the members of the church for offering up a generous donation to help take care of his needs. And he, he responds by saying this, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. And so what we see from Paul here and other examples is that if we are generous 
and unselfish with what we have, if we make giving God and helping others our first priority with our finances, if we pursue pleasing God and putting Him first above all other things, then we can trust that we will be okay. Paul says, great job, guys. You have done this. You have pleased the Lord with your um, offerings, and now God is going to meet all your needs with the riches of His glory in Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus says, but seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you. This is, again, after the worry passage. Seek His kingdom first, and all of these things you're worried about, they're all, they're all going to fall into place anyway, because you've made the right choice from the beginning. So, a few takeaways. Don't worry about your finances. Worrying is pointless. Instead, trust that God is going to take care of you. Secondly, at the same time, save up what you can. Save up as much as you can. Be diligent. Work hard. Be wise. Be a good steward of what God has given you. And thirdly, put God first. Make pleasing Him your priority, and you can trust that everything else is going to fall into place if you do that. And, you know, we've been talking about... Band, you guys can come on up. We've been talking about uh, material things, right? This is, a, this is a series on finances. And so we're thinking a lot about worrying and saving and pleasing the Lord from a material perspective. Um, we know we don't have to worry about material things. But you know what? It's a lot bigger than that. It's a lot, a lot bigger than that. Because of what Christ has done for us, we know that actually we don't have to worry about anything. Not only material things, we don't have to worry about anything. Because at the end of the day, you know what? If you're, if you're broke, if you're hungry, if you're homeless, at the end of the day, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can still have confidence in the promises that God gives you. At the end of the day, you still don't have anything to worry about, even if you're broke. Because you know you have a God who loves you. You know you have been given, forgiven of your sins and all of your past mistakes. They're wiped away, wiped clean by the Lord. You know where you're going when you die. You know that uh, you have riches upon riches waiting for you in heaven. And so what is there to worry about, really? <laughs> Get what I'm saying? With Christ, there's nothing to worry about. And so, guys, if you have not experienced that, if you don't... Um, if you've never made that decision to give your life to Christ and to, to, to give your worries and fears up to Him, uh, of course, we'd love to, to talk with you about that, and we'd love to talk with you about baptism and how um, God tells us that when we're baptized, our old sinful self, including our worries and our fears, they're washed away, and we're raised as a new person in Christ through baptism. We would love to talk to you about that. Uh, if you just have something financially that you want prayer for, uh, if you're having trouble with worries and fears, we'd love to pray with you uh, during this next song. So whatever it is, if, if you need to respond, um, please don't hesitate. We've got folks in the back of the room who would love uh, to talk and pray with you during this next song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for taking care of us. Just like the flowers in the field and the birds in the sky, we know that you uh, you watch over us, you love us, we are valuable in your eyes, and you want to take care of us. And so we ask that you help us to learn how to rely more on the promises that you've given us, help us to learn how to give our worries and our fears up to you, and to learn how to trust and have faith. We ask that you help us to be diligent and saving and be wise with our finances. We just ask that you help us to be a church who pleases you with our financial decisions and with our amount of faith and our generosity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.